G'day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the podcast. And make sure you check out Butts Mom Premium, where you can catch another episode of the podcast just for the premium members. It's fucking amazing. It's uncensored. It's fucking cocks are out. Dicks are swinging in the air. It's fucking unbelievable stuff. You will not believe what we got up to on Butts Mom Premium. No cocks are out. Just, um... Just buttholes. buttholes. Just buttholes this week. Buttholes this week. Doodles next week. Doodles next week. Make sure you're there. G'day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Butterfield Effect. My name's Isaac Butterfield. This podcast, we are basically going out there to ask some very interesting people some very interesting questions and find out some answers that maybe you wouldn't be able to find out uh, in the in the normal mainstream media or on a TV show. We get to have a conversation for a long period of time, and that's what I love about this show right here. And today's guest is an absolute cracker. This gentleman is one of Australia's most renowned homicide detectives. He was a part of the William Tyrrell investigation where a young boy went missing and is still missing, and he led that case and is one of the most prolific investigators that have ever graced the Australian shores, if you will. Now, his name is Gary Jubilant. He's a very interesting dude. He's a dude that we have, uh, in my household, had a lot of conversations about. And getting to know him is very, very enjoyable for me. He's someone that is very interested in becoming the best in his field. And that's what he's doing now. After a long period of time in the police force, he found himself outside of the police force. And now he's He's writing books and he's doing podcasts. His podcast, I Catch Killers, uh, which is available on Spotify, is great. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I listened to it yesterday uh, and the day before, the day before that, in preparation for this podcast, and it's great. Go and check it out, I Catch Killers. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is my chat with the great Gary Jubilant. Gary, welcome to the show. How you going, mate? How's lockdown? It's a strange world we live in, Isaac. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say I'm all zen and uh, it's fine, but uh, I think I'm struggling like everyone else, starting to you know bounce off the walls. Mate, we spoke on the phone the other day, and you're in a an apartment block. Is that is that correct? And there was a case yeah, down yeah. in the mail room or or something like that in the where all the post boxes are, and the whole building got locked. Yeah, down. it uh, it was uh, in a, a large apartment uh, complex, and uh, someone had come into the front office. This was going back about two or three weeks ago. That was um, uh, COVID uh, positive. And so then we all got uh, considered a casual uh, casual contact and it was uh, you can't get out and play until you had two negative tests. So it's just, yeah, it, it makes you sort of paranoid. I, I live on my own and uh, I, if I do go out, like go out to exercise or that, which I do each day, um, you wonder if you go into a shop, are you going to get that text saying you're a casual contact and then, uh, then yeah, more restrictions. So strange yeah. times. Well, we, uh, my partner, Claire, uh, who's a massive fan of you, and she, um, not that I'm not, I'm also a fan, hello. Um, <laughs> well, she, right, perhaps I should be speaking to Claire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, I said, do you want to say day to Gary? She goes, no, I do not want to say hello to Gary. I, I don't know what to say. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll. Claire, for the record, Claire says hello. Um, so <laughs> we were talking about uh, grabbing, because we're trying to find things to do, so we're talking about going to Bunnings and grabbing some flowers the other day and doing some planting, and we thought, well, it's all well and good. Like, we'll be fine if we catch it, that type of stuff. We're wearing masks. But if we go in and we're a casual contact, then we have to lock down for, for two weeks and we can't leave the house yeah. and we can't go and get groceries and we have to work out how to get them to live. And it's like, it's 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 not worth the risk. And, I mean, I know we spoke about it the other day, but the 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 new laws in pa- in place, the ability for the police to... Um, and you know, it's not it's not coppers, you know, who are sitting at home going, yes, finally we get to, you know, um, tell people what to do. It's you know, it's obviously yeah. the government, but this um, and as an ex copper yourself, this excess control must be a, a new, um, a strange sort of predicament for police officers to be in and, and to be able to wield that power. Do you think this is a bit of a compromising position for a lot of people to be in who are in the force? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's good because it's a health problem, and uh, policing's tied up with the health problem. And uh, I don't. I'd. I'd like to think no cops enjoy uh, you know telling people to move along when a, the mum's uh, playing in the park with a child or, or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a strange time. I hope it doesn't change people's um, 
view of the cops. Like we're there to help people. People call uh, cops in times of uh, trouble. I hope it doesn't look like it. Uh, it's like the prefect at school, basically. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing here? Um, so I think it's a difficult time for everyone. I, I personally, I worry that we, there's so many powers, and once you've got those powers, they're hard to to roll back. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised how compliant everyone is to to the powers. But uh, I think we all understand the the basis behind it but uh i do wonder how it'll all play out if the cops have to keep cracking down cracking down um whether it changes that relationship between the uh, police and the community yeah i mean we saw after 9 11 in america the um like the tsa's control and the ability for even the nsa to to go in and listen to phone calls of, of, of whoever and that was that was a bit of a conspiracy theory for a while. And then it came out the Freedom of Information Act that it was happening. People were listening to your phone calls. You know everything was being recorded. Yada yada yada. Yeah. Those laws that are put in place they never they are never repelled. The government never goes. And this isn't like sitting here going, oh, the government this, the government that. Like this is real life. It's not a conspiracy. Once the once these laws are in place, there's no going back. Like they're not going to relinquish that power. I I wondered that myself. And when the you know, the QR code first came in and uh, you use that to uh, go into wherever it's going to the local pub or, or restaurant. Um, I wondered how that would be. I, I know from a, a detective's point of view, I'd love to get hold of those records. If I mm. want to track Isaac Graham, what, what have you been up to in the past 24 hours? It would be great to hang on to those records. Now, I think initially they said they you know, wouldn't be used for that. It's purely for uh, the health purposes. But, uh, yeah, I, I suppose the time, time will tell whether they're, uh, they're destroyed or how they're, how they're used. Mm, and it, it's, I guess it's one of those arguments like, uh, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I shouldn't be worried and, and then that type of thing. But, you know, how much of your freedom and how much of your, your privacy do you want to give up? And I, I think we're, we're quite relaxed when it comes to privacy now, like on Facebook, that type of stuff, you know, you often see someone, if you Google something, you Google, like what did I Google the other day? Sheds, I'm getting a garden shed. And now you see the pop-ups for, for shed ads yeah. constantly. They're trying to get you to buy that um, that piece of uh, equipment or whatever it happens to be. And it's the same with um, whether you, you search someone. If, you, if you're a single person and you're, you're searching, you know, you know, chicks on whatever, you know, you get the ads for the dating apps and all that type of stuff. Once people have your private information, it becomes uh, a commodity. It becomes the ability to sell it is something that the people sort of, they try and find a way to make money off whatever information they can have off you. And I think that's what people just don't sort of understand is if you can get people's information through QR codes and you can understand a lot about a person, you can come up with a picture of everything they like and dislike and how much time they spend here, there and everywhere. If you go to Woolies and you do a QR code and then you work out, you know, off your everyday rewards card, this is what I buy, then you can go, okay, they spend this much time, they go to this aisle, they spend that much time in that aisle, you know, they go through your average time in the in the store they can work out how much stuff to send you, advertising materials. They can work out when you're going to come in next, when to hit you with the right up marketing uh, information. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes I like getting you know ads sent to me. I go, yeah, no, I, I do need that. But yeah. it's a trade-off. How much information do you want other people to have about you? Um, the information that you'd never tell a stranger. How many strangers do you want to have with that information about your daily do doings, if you will? Yeah, it, it's scary, that type of power. And I, I have changed my views, I, I think, to a degree in, in light of what happened to me when I found myself on the wrong side of law and uh, and knowing the pressure of having the states uh, pursue you, it's quite daunting. And I, I was sort of set up very well to deal with that because I, I you know, knew the system. I do get concerned about the, uh, the invasion of privacy and that. And I, I hear people say, well, I do nothing wrong, so, you know, What's it matter? I don't think I do anything wrong, but there's still there's that side of me that just thinks a little bit more control because we're putting then a lot of trust in the people that have the power. And uh, power can corrupt and, uh, yeah, power can be abused. And, and that's what wor worries me. We might say, well, the leaders we've got in place at the moment are fine. They're not going to abuse the power. But what if that leadership changes? Mm. And, uh, and where are the citizens' rights? So, I believe with the pandemic, I, I'm not I'm not informed enough to offer offer an opinion on how it how it should be done or could this have been done. But I make this observation: you put the word pandemic in front of something, and everyone's too scared to question. 
anything because you don't want to be the person that's the, the non-believer. And uh, I think checks and balances are important and uh, to balance out power, you need people, you know, you need the radicals arguing, well, what about this? And between the two extremes, you might get the right area. So yeah, it does worry me where we're heading at the moment, but uh, yeah, time, time will tell. Hope, hopefully we come through this and uh, we're all still normal. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, well, they, be, sorry, go on. Is it, sorry. Yeah. It'll be difficult to remain normal. And, it, and it's it's a long time, and whether or not this this goes on for another five years, ten years, it is going to be, um, you know, we're just seeing right now with Afghanistan almost the end of that saga from 9-11, 20 years. Um, you know, will this be the next 20 years? Will this be the fight that we obsess ourselves with? Will this be the media's, um, you know, their big... Because from someone who writes, you know, I write um, yeah. four videos a week, right? I know how great it is when a story comes in that I know people will click on. I'm just, I'm stoked because yeah. it's less work. Yeah. And I feel that's where journalists are right now. They're just like, yep, yeah, boom, let's go. Another story, fear, 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 terror. Well, I, it, it's an inter interesting observation you got there. And uh, I know the, that there's a lot to be made from uh, terminology and we're talking the war on COVID. And all mm. of a sudden we've found ourselves a war. <laughs> we've got a yeah. war now. It's uh, the health issue that we're dealing with, but the terminology that I'm hearing some of the leaders um, say, this is a war on COVID, everyone falls in the line. Oh, we're at war. And uh, I I now work in the media too. And it, it's sort of, uh, I, I'm a big supporter of the media, but I also understand the power of the media and getting a sense of the media and uh, to talk it up. And, uh, you know, we have these... Um, I say body counts and it, it sort of cheapens it. So I don't, I don't want to uh, diminish what's happening where people are dying. But, uh, yeah, we're waiting each day to get the report on how many people have had COVID, how many people have died. And uh, I think, I don't know, I, I just don't like the environment. I don't like the way it's been uh, been dealt with there or, or reported on. But uh, is there another way? I don't know. I'm, I'm just sort of throw, throwing that up as a... Uh, well you're 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 locked down uh, in your apartment for two weeks, yeah. um, and even now you're still there. Like yeah. you, you, the yeah. lockdown, probably I, I would assume isn't as hectic as it was when you had cases downstairs, but you're still there. You're on your own. You have a history of being a very headstrong person, but not everyone's yeah. in that situation. You know, uh, yes. the rise of, and this is something that people don't report on, and I, I see a lot of people, particularly left-leaning people, and I'm not, you know, not to go full left-right, all that type of stuff, yes. but I see a lot of people who work in the media on the left side of things, or even left thinkers, um, they disregard the whole idea that, that the risk of suicide is greater now than it was perhaps two years ago. And they, they, they point to the numbers. They say, listen, there isn't as many suicides right this second. And I say, okay, fine. You may have those stats on your side right now, but the um, the Australian, uh, it was the board of certified general practitioners came out with this statistic that was 25%. There was an increase of 25% of anti-anxiolytic and antidepressants prescribed to people in the last six months of last year. And I can only imagine it would probably follow that trajectory now. So that leads me to the question, and as someone who, who's, who's worked as a copy, you would see suicide more than most. Um, people don't just kill themselves willy-nilly. It's usually a chronic illness. Yeah. These people who are stuck in their homes with all their thoughts, their demons on a daily basis, particularly the ones that live alone or they live in a relationship that it isn't um, as you know, and happy and loving as it probably should be. Uh, domestic violence, maybe their children are there 24-7 and they're trying to uh, juggle all these things. Where do you see that going? Because it can't, be, it can't be a good place. I have concerns about that and I look at it again. I, I, I use myself as a, the test bunny, for want of a better word. I consider myself fairly resilient and I've got tools to... Deal, deal with things. I, I train every day. I, I, I can do meditation every day. And I've got work every day that I can, can do at home. And, yeah, call me stubborn, call me pig-headed, I don't know. But it's starting to wear me down. And I'm thinking, well, I'm a fairly resilient person that's having an effect on me. And I'm wondering if people that are in a, you know, not as set up as I am to deal with a situation like this, how they're, how they're coping with it. I think there will be ramifications. And, uh we're very adaptable, and this is my observation, human nature, we're very adaptable to our environment. 
I'm getting to the point now, because this is day 55 of lockdown or whatever, the thought of actually going out in public is starting to go, oh, <laughs> maybe I don't want to go to the pub on a Friday night. You know, it, it, it's strange. I'm becoming, I've worked out that I'm boring in my own company. <laughs> that's something that's uh, yeah, a revelation, even at my <laughs> stage of life. But um, yeah, I, I'm starting to adapt to the situation. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what are we up to today, Gary? I'm not sure, Gary. What We'll do a little bit of this or we'll do a little bit of that. I'm adapting to the situation, so I'm not fighting it each day, but I don't want to be that antisocial person, but I feel like it's turning me into an antisocial person. People make the comments to me, well, you've got phone, you've got Zoom or, or whatever, you're contacting friends and family. I was speaking to my mother just uh, yesterday and uh, she mentioned whether I, I've spoken to my kids and I said, oh, I haven't for a couple of days and there's not much to actually talk about when you speak to them because no one's doing anything. And I, that was sort of me, just the realisation why I'm not sort of reaching out to people. What am I going to discuss? What have you been up to today? I was telling my, uh, telling my son uh, about two weeks ago, I, I put a, uh, I put a um, uh, hinge on a cupboard in the laundry that I've been looking at fixing for a long time. He's gone, Dad, that's pretty damn boring. But <laughs> that was the biggest <laughs> thing that happened to me that, that week. So, yeah, it's, it's going to have an impact. It, it has to have an impact. I worry about, you think when your life, um, you know, 14 to 17 years of age, you know, yeah, your life every day was an adventure. Every day felt like a year. I worry about people at that age where, you know, you, your path for life can change very dramatically in those times and they're missing out on things and uh, I feel sorry for them. Um, even even so, a couple of years older, not going out not meeting, you know, for dudes, not meeting girls, for girls, not meeting dudes or whatever, you know, not yeah. being able to, you know, make mistakes, get pissed, do silly things. You know, you're missing out well, on all those. Think, yeah, you think when you're in your early 20s, every day was a, an adventure. Every day you were going to do something stupid and uh, it, you loved it. That's been taken taken away. At, at least, yeah, you know, at my stage in my life, I've got my memories. I can yeah. think, okay, I remember what the world was like. So... I even worry, and this is not scientifically based, but uh, with us getting around with masks all the time, kids, they're like yep, sponges. 100%. When I talk kids, I'm talk, talking infants, and they read body language. They lead, yep. read facial expressions. What are, we, what are we creating in a world where everyone's got a mask on? Are we going to um, – um, people that are stunted in their emotional growth and reading body language, which, yeah, we all know those people that just don't get it, like yeah. uh, they don't pick up on the cues. Is that going to be a byproduct of, uh, of what's happening here too? So, so yeah. I, th I thought about that and, and I agree with you. I wonder if it had an impact in uh, Asian countries who constantly wear the masks prior to this. I mean, I, I guess they're not wearing it all the time in every yeah. place. Um, but it's certainly, you would think that, for young people learning how what a smile is and whether someone's happy or sad or sarcastic, like that's going to take yep. away from it. I know I've been in the shops and talking to someone and made a joke and, you know, normally you can sort of, you know, facial expression comes yeah. into it a lot. Yeah. And old mate was just like, oh, you're a prick. I was like, no, no, I was just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so yeah. like, it's a tough one yeah. and it's tragic for, for, for young kids and teenagers and you know living their best life like as you said you've got the memories i you know i'm in the stage of my life where we've settled down and we're getting married next year all that type of stuff and yep. i've got all those great memories of all those silly things and with, with your mates and all that type of stuff and um and you see the kids out now you know they're, they're going to parties when they shouldn't be and facing you know they could get fined and but you know what would you have done in, in those times and i think maybe i would have done something that that may be seen as illegal now um, you know, going yeah. to a party when you shouldn't be or, or drinking with your mates down the park or something. I, I, I yeah, I look at that too and there was a, a crew of them that were caught out or not any specific ones that uh, young fellas that uh, have decided we're going to get together. Well, yeah, I would have probably done something stupid like that at that age because you, you, you're thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the broader society or, or whatever that hasn't developed into you. So yeah, there's going to be uh, problems. How it plays out, I don't know. It's um, I'd like to think that we'll bounce back, but I know it's changed me. I, I think everyone that's been through this, it's changed. And uh, one of the things is that we're, what are we? August now, and uh, I've been waiting for this year to start. 
that's how I felt mm-hmm. like this year. I'm waiting for it to start and it's now August and uh, it's just passing us by and it's almost like we're just in a holding pattern waiting to get back to uh, get back to life. Yeah, and you know, you're sitting every day looking at the eleven o'clock update from from Gladys or, or Dan Andrews or whoever's in charge in your state. I, call, I call them the, the school assemblies. Hundred percent. The principals here. You know, everyone quiet down. <laughs> so, All right, let's show some the, respect. The, the headmistress is telling us whether we can play on the oval or, or oh, play yeah. in the uh, 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 quadrangle. It's, no jab, uh, no yeah. play. I mean, it's yeah, it's a strange one. But and then you look at you know, conversely, you look at what's happening in Afghanistan. And, and it's just a whole nother thing. Like that, when you start talking about the war and, you know, um, the Queensland Premier said, you know, this is our last line of defence. It's like, come on. You can't say that shit when you've got these, excuse me, these people overseas going through the worst time in their lives and it's a tough country to be in at the start of that. Yeah, I, I I really don't like that terminology, the war. And I think it's disrespectful to people who have actually been through yeah. war. This is a health crisis. It's not a war. And uh, you're quite right. You look at Afghanistan. And I'm, I'm just mortified by what's, uh, what's oh. going on there. And, we're, and and now I think in this day and age, you're seeing it. You're seeing it live. You know, before it would be delayed, oh, this is what's happened, or there'd be little bits coming out. You're seeing what's happened, and you can just see the fear and terror on uh, on people over there. So oh, yeah. well, You don't need to look much further than the footage of people jumping on um, aircraft as it takes off. Like no one does that would, in their right mind. That is complete a fear, a complete fear response. Like no one in yeah, their right mind would ever do that. They know that it's not going to end well. That was horrible. And uh, you know, if you want to know what's happening on the ground, well, that gives you a sense of what's happening on the ground. If people are hanging on to aeroplanes like that, that was uh, horrific. You've got women and children crying in the street because they don't want to go back to the world they were once in. And it's just yeah. you got these pricks, these Taliban dudes, holding press conferences. Like it yeah, is know, it's, strange. It, it is uh, is strange, and uh, you, you sit there and watch, and it, it sort of puts in perspective what uh, what's going on here. Like if we if we think this is a war, this is not no. a war. That, no. That's a, that's a war. Listening to your podcast um, the other day, I've been I've been doing a lot of running lately, and I was listening to your podcast yeah. whilst running. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a very good runner. I'm, I'm six, eight, and 110 running kilos. Away, so. Running away from it or to it? <laughs> running away from problems, you know, why not? Whatever. Whatever it, whatever it is, I'm doing it. And um, I was listening to the conversation, your, your most recent one in your podcast, which you can get on Spotify, I Catch Killers. Highly recommend it. Your, your, your recent one with uh, your, your ex-partner uh, in, uh, in Homicide. Um, and that was really interesting to hear how your mindset of it was almost like it was almost like a TV show. How your mindset was like, no, like we're going to crack whatever case we're on, um, regardless of the ramifications of what happens outside of this, whether it's family or whether yeah. it's whatever. Like this is our focus, and I think with with police officers and particularly detectives, like they are really throwing their entire lives into whatever they're looking into. And I, I, I re- it was quite eye-opening to listen to you two guys talk about um, your, your first case. Uh, well, the, the first case that you guys were working on together, the Bowerville yeah. uh, case. And it was, yeah. I think it was three um, young Aboriginal people um, or children, That's rather, uh, who were murdered. And yeah. you guys, you lived that case. I mean, I wonder if you could, if you could go into that uh, case a little bit, give people a bit of a, an overview yeah. And how you sort of found yourself in that position? Because I know a lot of people want to hear about um, a lot of other cases, and they want to hear about yep. you on the beat and all that type of stuff. But but that fascinated me because it all it was almost a fight against um, it was almost a fight against the local police as well in in a way yep. where it was yep. you know they weren't giving that case the time of day uh, where they should have been. Yeah, uh, the Barrival case. So you're talking 1990, 91. So it's 30, 30 years ago. Three Aboriginal children living on the uh, uh, in the area that was referred to as a mission in Barrival. So out to, on the outskirts of the Barrival Township on the mid north coast of New South Wales. Over a five and a half month period, three kids were uh, murdered: uh, Colleen Walker, Clinton Speedy, and Evelyn Greenup. And uh, they all lived in the same street and they were Aboriginal kids. Now, the response by the New South Wales police uh, was not sufficient for the circumstances of what was happening there. We had a, a um, serial killer 
operating in a township and it, it should have if it was three white kids um in on the north shore of sydney the response would have been completely different now this is not me just you know sprouting out the actual uh commission or previous commissioner came up the barrel and apologized and said it could have been done differently the uh, partner you're referring to jason evers he's a good uh, good mate of mine that's where we first uh first met and uh I had been in homicide for a year or two. There was a person that had been charged with uh, one of the murders and he was acquitted. On the basis of that, the community, the Aboriginal community in Barrowville protested and uh, a reinvestigation was set up. So that was say 1996, where I got involved in the investigation. I went up there, I, I had a young family at the time. Um, it's not a job that I really wanted to get involved in because I knew it was going to be a lot of time away from home up, up the North Coast. But I went there open eyed. I didn't think that uh, race played a part in any investigation. I, I, I was naive, I was ignorant. And I went up there and thought, well, yeah, the Aboriginal community, they speak English. How, can, how difficult can this be? I'll get in there and, uh, and find out what's happened as a homicide detective from the city. So I get up to uh, Barrowville with all the swagger that you'd expect of a homicide detective from the city going to a small country town. And uh, it opened my eyes to things. And uh, the families and the community, they changed me as a person, not, not just as a police officer, it changed me as a person because I'd go in there and, uh, yeah, I'm a homicide detective from the city, I'm making an appointment to see someone. And you know, they, they had to point out to me, that's not how it works around here, it's jury time. And I had to slow my pace, pace down, not in a negative sense, not in an unproductive sense, but understand that the way things were done there. And uh, I got to know the community very well. And uh, so did Jason and uh, we worked on it together for 10 years. Now, when I say I work on a homicide for 10 years, think people think that's the only homicide I work on. We do other homicides, but you, you, you juggle a few cases at the time. And it just saddened me what happened with the uh, community up there and no one cared. But uh, to condense it down, because it's a long, it's a battle over 25 years or more that I've been involved with the families trying to get justice. It's resulted in, uh, we marched on Parliament, um, Macquarie Street in Sydney. I, I marched, I think, three or four times. This is before Black Lives Matters marches became, uh, became a thing. But uh, we'd block off Macquarie Street and I'd march with the families to the New South Wales Parliament. And uh, on the back of the protests, uh, parliamentary uh, uh, inquiry was conducted about the matter. They got legislation changed, double uh, jeopardy legislation, which in a nutshell, if someone's been acquitted of a crime such as murder, they could never be recharged. So you could get, I could charge you with murder. You could get acquitted at court and then walk out on the steps of court and go, well, I did it. I got away with it. And there was yep. nothing we could do about it. So the, the community managed to uh, change, uh, change that. We're still fighting for justice. So we're still fighting as we speak, even though I've been out of the cops, I speak to the families regularly. And they, um, uh, people say you've got to um, uh, separate yourself from, uh, from an investigation. I say bullshit, lazy people say that. I throw myself into a homicide investigation. You've got to be prepared to bleed for it. Um, and if you don't, do, do something else because when someone's life has been taken, but they've taught me so much and they're so resilient. They've had so many kicks in the guts and setbacks and all that. And the thing that amazes me is the families still think they will get justice and they still respect the legal system, even though they've been kicked that much. But it's opened my eyes to racism and Australia, we think we're not racist, but you know, what took place um, in the Barrable community, it's racism. And uh, so it sort of op opened my eyes and, it, I think it defined me of the defined me as the type of detective I wanted to be, and that was always about looking after the victims, and uh, they're the ones that uh, sort of showed me the way. So where does that case stand now? You've got a person; uh, they changed the legislation. There's a person that uh, we got it to the court of criminal appeal um, in relation to um, the two of the two of the cases. The Court of Criminal Appeal rejected the uh, submission. There's still um, efforts being made to uh, put the matter back before the court. So 
though no one's been uh, been acquitted, at least the families know that people care about it and it's opened mm. their eyes up to things. There's a documentary that's uh, coming out very soon and uh, the subject to COVID that uh, called Bearable. And uh, I, yeah, I recommend anyone that wants to have a look at uh, something, that, an injustice in this country or get an understanding of racism in this country, watch that documentary. It's very, very powerful, the families telling, telling their stories. So, yeah, there's still three kids that have been murdered and no one's been called into account. And I think when we talk about racism in Australia, like we often talk about, and this is, I've been guilty of this. You think about yourself and you go, well, I wouldn't, I don't care. Like I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't see this as a problem between, you know, I don't see black people and go, oh my God, that's a black person, yada, 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 or think differently of them because of, you know, their, their, uh, where they've come from or, or where their grandparents have come from. But when you talk about you know, system, systemic racism and systematically introduced racism, whether it is through the courts or whether it's through policing or the way we look at the death or, in this case, the death of a child that is black in comparison to one who is white in a poor community in relation to a rich community. Like that is that is the racism that a lot of people fight against, hate, and see it consistently throughout the world. And I think yeah. that's it's it's important for us to remember that um, you know, on this channel, I always talk about you know, you know, it's not about you know, not about race, and that doesn't matter. But yeah. in a lot of systems, it still does exist, and we must continue to fight against it. Uh, and that's obviously what you did for, for a long yeah. period of time, and continue to do. Well, it's I. There's an unconscious bias that uh, people, and I, I fully understand what you're you're saying. That uh, I went through life thinking, well, I, I'm not racist. I, I don't look at people differently, and I genuinely believe that. But there's this unconscious bias in uh, racism that uh, can have a devastating effect because during the early part of that investigation, um, there was suggestions that the children went on walkabout because that was, you know, that's what Aboriginal kids did. Speak to the families and they say that's ridiculous. What, where, where is that coming from? But that's that, mm. that um, unconscious bias that people have this perception. I, I've seen it not just play out in uh, the the investigation into the um, bearable matter. And I've done quite a few, uh, I've, I've worked a lot with Indigenous communities and they've all experienced that the same type of thing that uh, the bearable community. But I saw it with a murder of a uh, young Asian lady. I won't, won't mention her name, but uh, she was found, um, found on the uh, mid-north coast, not far from uh, where, where you, you're based. And uh, she was naked in the water and had stab wounds, defensive uh, wounds. It was a horrific uh, thing. I got called up to uh, up to uh, lead the investigation. I was on on call, inspector, and people were saying. I heard uh, a, a police officer said to me that, uh, "Oh, she must have been a prostitute." Now that assumption was made because she was Asian and she was naked, and uh, I, I said to the cop, uh, and I, I was sort of pissed off. I said, "Why are you saying that?" And, uh, well, she's Asian and uh, she's in, in the water. Must have been a prostitute. I said, no, it was a lady that fought for her life and that she's got defensive wounds all, all over her hands and arms and everything else. But it's not just police. And I don't think that person meant anything offensive by it. He was ignorant to the fact of his, his biases. I had uh, journalists that uh, were there at the scene uh, said, is, is she a sex worker? Yeah, it's uh, that type, type of thing. Just this perception now... If everyone has that view, you're just blinded to where the where the truth is. And uh, what it was, she was a uh, a young lady, a student that uh, was brutally murdered by this psychopath, and uh, that was uh, stalking her. And uh, it was a horrendous crime. But it just saddened me that was the perception, and that's that unconscious bias. Now, you check people on that, and most people would, um, yeah, they'd be shocked that they were racist. But uh, that's that that sort of subtle insepid racism that can sort of creep in and distort uh, distort views. I think I think that the, the the tag that people give people as a racist, I think it's 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 deeper than that. I think the people who would look at you differently if you were an Asian student or, or look at you as a prostitute or look at you differently because you're an Aboriginal person and and hate you or or, or dislike mm. you. I think they're the same people that would they're just shit people. They'd kick their dog. They might hit their yeah. missus. They they'd get aggressive yeah. in a car. They're just shit people, yeah. and that yeah. and it's just it's a comment on their personality. It's got nothing to do with the person who is uh, not white in that situation. It's got yeah. nothing to do with them. They're just shit people. 
Yeah, I, I agree, one hundred percent. And uh, there was there was some. I had some classic arguments with uh, with people over Barrival, which because people um, see a cop like redneck cop, uh, he'll be racist. Yeah. So people felt comfortable in uh, in making comments to me. And uh, I remember Jason and I, the, the bloke we we're talking about before, were uh, somewhere on the north coast, and this bloke's found out that we were. Um, investigating the bearable matter and he said what are you going to do if you find the bloke give him a reward um that type of thing now yeah. that bloke i won't say what we said to him because it would just be beep 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 but we <laughs> gave it to him Good, and uh, as you should i'm sure <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he sort of would have readjusted his, his thinking but he thought that uh yeah as a uh, as a cop we're, we're two white cops we just uh we just join in with him and on uh, on that so yeah well, I, I, I get the same i get the same thing i had um, some people where we've just moved, they recognised me. They'd seen my stand up, and that they yeah. said, um, "I said, oh, you know, do you like the neighbourhood?" She goes, "Yeah, there's a few too many Asian people here or Indian people." I was like, yeah. "What? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> you just freely give that information out that you hate Indian people? What the fuck's wrong with yeah. you?" I, yeah. I mate, I, I hate it, and people tag me with that shit, and it does my head in. Like I know. Yeah. I know, like, I don't have to defend it. I know I'm not a racist person, but people throw that shit out there now like it's just, it's going out of fashion and it does my head in because I, I genuinely hate that shit. But, you yeah. know, it's it's one of those things. You, there's crazy people anywhere. And I, I guess that's a question that I'd like to ask you. You talked about a psychopath that went after that young lady. And, yeah. on, and on that, even if she was a prostitute, does that even matter? She's oh, dead exactly. in the water. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. Why would you exactly. bring that up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Psychopaths, killers, people who would go through that process of uh, taking someone's life, whether it's a plan or whether it's an outburst of anger and violence. How many of these people exist in daily society, do you think? There's, I, so we don't sort of um, make people look at everyone in everyone. <laughs> yes. just look, at, look at that bloke. And it's a, it's a thing that uh, psychopath or sociopath that can be thrown out very Loosely, do you do that like when you're at the shops? Do you look at that bloke and go, mm, "I'm a bit well, sus on you." I hate to say, say, of course say you this. Do. <laughs> no, I hate to say it. Please don't take offence. The beard. Now, I I sat in an interview room with one of the worst killers I, I've dealt with. He was a bad human being, psychopath, one hundred percent, and uh, he had a beard, not dissimilar to the beard that oh, you've got. I call it, say, right. a Ned Kelly beard. <laughs> yeah. For a long time, every time I looked at someone with a beard like that, I'd be going, oh, yeah, because this bloke <laughs> was a... <laughs> Look, and I don't... You can beat this out if you have to, but no, this bloke no, was a mur murdering pedophile and he had a, oh. had a big, long beard and I was seeing threat in that. So that, that sort of changed... That distorted my view of, uh, you yeah, oh. appearances and that. But Fucking hell, Gary. Jeez. So, <laughs> sorry, don't take it to heart. I've got yeah. over it. I'm not. Nah, how could I take? Mother. How could I possibly <laughs> take that to heart? I'm a murdering pedophile. But go on, yep, yeah, good for good on uh, you. Yeah, that aside, that aside, um, he, that bloke, and I spent. I, I'll tell you the tell you the uh, story. It was horrific. It was um, New Year's Day, two thousand and four. Uh, I was on call for homicide, so I got a call about two or three o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, Went to uh, went to the uh, crime scene. It was down in uh, down in Sydney, and I was living up the coast at the time. And uh, there was a, a person had been killed. We thought that he'd been shot because of the amount of uh, in injuries that he had. And then we found out that he hadn't been shot. He'd been attacked by a hammer, and uh, a ten year old girl had been abducted. And uh, very dramatic sort of time period 24 hour period we found out who it was and it was a bloke that had been released from prison after um serving eight years having abducted a, a 10 year old girl before and keeping her and sexually assaulting her and uh we caught him later that uh day so we'd been up sort of 12 14 hours looking for him we caught him we got the girl back and and that was good and then uh, i sat down and interviewed him and he was describing what he did, how he murdered the person and, and what he did to the uh, young girl. And uh, it was horrific. And he was sitting there saying, you want to belt me, don't you? You want to belt me? And uh, I, I said, yeah, 
no, regardless of whether I wanted to belt him or, or not, which I, I didn't because my role is to um, you know, make sure I put all the evidence before the court. But he was trying to bait me. Then he was telling, talking about the crime. And he was enjoying telling me the crime. Now, part of the role as a detective in the interview room, which I enjoy the interview room, but it can be very draining, is that uh, I'm not sitting there judgmental. So I'm just, oh, yeah, so then you did this and then you did that. And so he felt comfortable comfortable talking. After I spent about four or five hours in the uh, interview room with him, if you spend long enough with anyone, you build up a rapport. It's just human nature. You, it's mm. part and parcel of it. And it's very intense, uh, obviously, what we're talking about. When we finished with him, uh, there was cops go, uh, they wanted to kill him. And uh, yeah, and, and it's only talk. It's not uh, what they actually do. But I understand that. I understand the emotions. Uh, the crime that he committed was horrific. For sure. But the way, the way that I chose to get back at him, and this was my payback on him, that was his biggest moment in life. He was going to be in jail for the rest of his life and that was going to be oh yeah i told the police i shocked the police i did this did that they belted me and all that i said to people there just ignore him so i'm walking past him he's seen in the charge dock and he's he's looking up to me thinking oh we've got this relationship going because i've just been locked in a room with him for uh, five or six hours and uh I just said to my mates, uh, it was uh, what the cricket score was or whatever. So treated him like a, I've just caught someone for shoplifting. So that was my way of punishing him. By That was his big moment. I'm going to show you that it means nothing to me. You're just an yeah. insignificant piece of shit that uh, no one cares about. And that was my, my payback on him. But you spend, uh, you do a job like that and you come out drained. Like you, you're facing pure evil and uh, taking a long way back to answering your question with uh, psychopaths, sociopaths. There's not a lot of them out there. It's, uh, I won't say a handful, there's more than that that I, I've sat or, or, you know, went for um, as a homicide detective trying to, uh, trying to catch or catching them. There's a lot of people that are uh, murderers that, um, you know, organised crime. There's some psychopaths in there, but a lot of times like bikies and that, they're just people that uh, are looking to be long to a family. Um, mm. And quite often it's like kids that haven't grown up from school. And I'm not saying that across the board for bikies, but they, they want a sense of belonging. And uh, they haven't got the emotional intelligence to de-escalate. And sometimes violent acts happen because uh, you said this to me, I said that to you, and it escalates up like that. And then someone uh, gets stabbed or, or shot and... Uh, I see a lot of lot of that. I don't necessarily think all people that commit crimes are, are bad people, or even the bad people. There's some goodness in them. I'm, I'm a big one for that yin yang side of side of things. And uh, so I've uh, I've developed relationships with uh, people that have uh, yeah, been bad, and I've dealt with them over the years. And uh, I can have a conversation with them. I can sit down and uh, and talk to them, and I can see there's some goodness in them. And perhaps that sliding door moment in life took them down a path that uh, they haven't been able to turn around. And uh, I, th I think that's it's sad when you see that because you see people that, Jesus, their life could have been completely different if they just took that different path when they're at that crossroad. Yeah, and I, I guess it comes down to the the life they lead, uh, lived before before they got to a, an adult and, you know, the, the whole idea that, you know, he, at one point this piece of shit was a baby and, and, you know, what's happened to that person from that yeah. point forward? You know, have they been dropped on their head? Have they been abused? Have they, if they are uh, displaying these uh, sexual tendencies towards children, did that happen to them? Um, yeah. I, I mean, there's so many things that can happen to a person. And obviously it doesn't negate the horrible things they have done, but it certainly yeah. gives you an answer and an understanding, you know, as a copper or as a civilian, why has this happened or how has this happened? It sort of gives you an idea of, how this has yeah. even occurred. And I, I've been on a sort of interesting journey since I've left the cops because when um, I was in the cops, I, I definitely had empathy and that, that carried me well. And I think you speak to any good detective and uh, or people ask me what makes a good detective and I think someone with empathy um, is a head of, head of the game. You need that empathy to understand where people are coming from. But in the cops, I'd be on a case, I'd be after the person responsible and, right, got them, move on to the next one. So you didn't have much time to reflect on why did this person turn out that way. Since I've left the cops, um, 
and doing the podcast, I've been speaking to some, uh, yeah, some truly bad guys. And uh, it's interesting, their story and why they got to where they are and, and how it happened. So it, it's sort of giving me a different perspective on it. And uh, I'm not making excuses for the crimes they committed. And uh, I wouldn't be speaking to people that had excuses for the crimes they committed. I like the fact that, you know, if I'm speaking to an armed robber, they, they, they can say, yeah, that's what I did. I, I robbed banks. I was an armed robber. I respect that. But yeah. um, I also understand that uh, things could have been different. They could have joined, could have joined the cops and uh, or, you know, do something. They could have been a florist. Who knows? But their life journey took them down the wrong way. And then it, by the time they got that emotional intelligence to realise what they're doing is wrong, it was too late. So, Has, there, has there ever been someone, you talked about the interview room, has there ever been someone yeah. you've sat across from and you couldn't pick that they're the bad guy. You just thought, no, nah, there's no way. I I think, and this might be how the cops have, have changed me, nothing shocks me. And sometimes I, I'm going into the interview room and I think, yeah, you've got to go in there with a, a confidence. You've got to go in there with the attitude, this is, this is the right person. But when they finally admit to it, sometimes I'm shocked by it, thinking, Fuck! You really did do that. <laughs> like, mm. yeah, you know, it can't, comes as a, a shock to you. But uh, I, I've learned that people are capable of, yeah, you know, uh, people are capable of anything. So nothing really surprises me. What uh, what comes out that uh, the reasons that uh, people commit uh, serious serious crimes. But uh, there's not many people that uh, I've locked up that I really didn't see it coming. Like, as in. It just didn't fit. Like I accept the evidence shows that they're the person that might be DNA evidence, but most of the times I can reconcile with the fact that yeah, I understand that that is the person that's uh, person that's done it. But uh, yeah, some of them are just dancing to a different beat from what you and I are. That uh, I can I can't work out what's going on in the, the, their heads and the way they they look at things, and it, it's quite uh, quite eerie. You feel you feel drained when you spend a lot of time with them. Even even going after them because you've got to um, evolve yourself into that or, or submerge yourself into that world, whatever world that that is. And uh, by the time you finish it, you know that you've changed a little bit. It takes a little bit out of you each each investigation. But uh, yeah, that's a price I, I was prepared to pay in the in the cops. And uh, I certainly wasn't a conscript. Like I did twenty five years investigating homicides. I, I loved it. But, you know, what do you do for a job? I catch killers. Like. Fuck! It was great. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was something that uh, you could really throw yourself into. Um, it changes you, but uh, yeah. I mean, I in you saying that I I worked with uh, with got a lot of guys with schizophrenia before I did um, uh, stand up, and yeah, I started to get to the point where I was concerned that I might develop schizophrenia just because you're around yeah. them all the time. And yeah, I remember one night I was dropping. Um, my girlfriend at the time, Claire, who's now my fiance, she I was dropping her at home, uh, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, like something was running across the road. It would look like a, some type of wolf or something, and I knew it wasn't yeah. there. And it, you know, looking back on it, it must have just been the shadows or whatever. But I was convinced for a week that I had schizophrenia. I was just convinced. Yeah. I was like, well, just be, I must have caught it or something. Like yeah. just crazy yeah. things yeah. like that. You start to evolve into that environment. Is there much in place in the police to save police officers from going down that dark hole of either whether it is you know uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, yeah. or just just for lack of a better term, losing it? Yeah, I. It, it's better than it's better now than what it was. Obviously, I think we've we've become aware of it. Uh, in homicide, we had, uh, I think it was every 12 months, you had to see a psychologist. Uh, and then I, I think it's just before I left, it was every every six months. And uh, I think that was good because cops being cops, we're not going to put, put our hands up and go, oh, I need, need help. But because you were rostered, you had to attend or you, you, know, you got taken off the, off the team, you had to attend. And so you'd turn up with the uh, 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 psychologist and you'd be going, <laughs> You'd be walking out the office to your mate, so I've got to go see the psychologist now. And uh, but actually, it was quite good sitting down because you could actually talk talk about things. I think we we're a little bit reluctant in that you worried that it was going to be used against you. Like if I went in there and said, "I feel like fucking killing everyone I see," yeah, yeah. obviously they're going to have to report it. But I think that was good. I've been involved in some um, critical incidents, and uh, 
I've also, in my role as a homicide uh, detective or an inspector, I had to oversee where police had shot and killed people and, uh, and uh, what's termed a critical incident. I was involved in some uh, shooting incidents and uh, I remember the first one uh, I was involved in where I was leading the investigation and it was a bloke that uh, had committed an armed robbery and uh, I was talking to him when he was shot and killed by another, another police officer. And I think it was six months before that I'd been involved in a shooting where a police officer had, had been shot when some dogs were um, set on him on a drug raid. I felt I felt bad with this, like I was talking to this bloke that was shot and killed and also because the person came to me because they knew my family and provided me information and asked me, promised not to hurt the person that I was going to go arrest for the um, robbery. So it was, yeah, pretty wow. bad, uh, bad yeah. situation. I felt shit after that, but this was going back a long time and the way they dealt with it in the cop's end, they had a, I think it was a psychologist came in called us all in, this is, you know, within hours of the shooting, sat us all around in a circle and said, now, has anyone got a problem? Like, <laughs> we're not going to put our hands up and go, no. oh, yeah, I can't deal with this, I feel really bad or break down and cry or whatever. So we all said, no, no, no. And then the, um, uh, the psychologist said, right, the worst thing you could do is go out and get on the drink. You should go home, go for a run, train, do something, something like that. Cops being cops, we went to the pub, straight to the pub got on the piss after, you know, two or three beers, we started to feel good about ourselves and, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we can handle this. I remember that night when I went home and uh, I got dropped home, um, dropped home, and that was a shocking night. I, I felt really bad and what was going through my mind at that time was I didn't join the cops to kill someone. Like, I, I, I felt like quitting the cops at, at that stage and I remember that night, it was just a horrible night. And then uh, I sort of dusted myself off the next uh, over the next couple of days and sort of got back into it. But uh, I haven't seen anyone that uh, in the police. I, I, I know a lot of people in the police and, and dealt with a lot of people in the police that have um, shot and killed people. And I haven't seen anyone that it hasn't affected. It's uh, yeah, no one goes to work to um, take someone's life and. Uh, if they weren't affected in some way, I, I'd say that there might be a problem there too. So, I guess becoming uh, does one ever become used to seeing death? <clears throat> you get hardened to it. Um, you get like in homicide, going to crime scenes time and time again. You get uh, you're not going to be shocked by it, but it's still, it still it still takes a little bit out of you. Sometimes I, I sometimes I just felt dirty. Like you're sitting at home, your family, loved ones or, or whatever, enjoying yourself, and the next thing you're at this crime scene, there's this horrific scene and someone's inflicted violence on, on someone and uh, it's, it gets to the point where you, you think, do I really want to see this? But the way I dealt with it, and everyone's got different ways of uh, dealing with it, but when I was at a crime scene, I was in work mode. So I wasn't trying to put a life into the body. There's time for grieving and once you got to know the victim later on and the sadness, but at that point in time, I think I just want to catch this prick, yeah, yeah. Whoever, whoever's done this. So you're in bang, bang, bang mode and uh, really, really focused and that, that served me well, I think. I, I guess my only experience with death was as this young dude who was playing uh, – he's making his first grade debut for the central Charlestown up here in Newcastle and he's playing with my yeah. brother – and uh, he collapsed on the field, had a, uh, some form of aneurysm that had already been forming in his brain. And that was, I think that was the, what they came to the conclusion of. And he just collapsed and, yep. uh, you know, those guys performing CPR and the mother uh, hitting her knees and screaming like that. I don't think I'll ever forget that. Like that was just, and I'm sure yeah. you've come across a thousand of those environments. Oh, yeah, and that's there. That's the stuff that really you know digs into you when you're yeah. um, dealing with the uh, the families and that um, that when they first find out. And uh, yeah, um, there's one I, I still stay in contact with it. Uh, Kathy Nolan, the mother of Michelle Pogmore, a young uh, 13 year old girl that was um, murdered out at Mount Druitt. It's still un unsolved, and uh, I remember uh, Michelle had um her mum had reported her missing and uh a body was found uh in a, a bin uh down there in oval at mount druid i remember it was a hot hot day and uh 
I had spoken to uh, spoken to Kathy and said, look, we don't know if it's Michelle, blah, blah, blah. And then when we had confirmation that it was Michelle's, uh, Michelle's body, I had to go tell, uh, tell Kathy. Mm-hmm. And I still um, remember pulling up in the car and, you know, they're looking out and I'm walking in and they could tell, they could tell what I was about to, to tell them and stuff like that. It, it sort of ne- never leaves you. And I, I caught up with uh, Kathy not that long ago, uh, a, a couple of months ago, and uh, it broke my heart in a house. She's still got her room set up for uh, Michelle, and we're talking this is going back you know, 15 years or, or more, and uh, she can't bring herself to uh, pack it up. Now, that, that's the type of grief you're talking where someone's, uh, someone's loved one has been, been murdered. Then you've got other ones where... The really, and I won't say really tragic because they're all tragic, but ones that really impact on people is where they haven't found the body. And uh, families like Colleen Walker's body from uh, Barrowville, her body's never been found. The clothes were found weighted down in the river um, with rocks, but her body was never been found. And her mother would go out looking around the um, bushland uh, searching for, for Colleen and uh, Mark and Faye Levison, whose uh, son Matt Levison uh, disappeared, um, disappeared. They would go out um, to the national park south of Sydney with a pick and shovel and just dig randomly, looking for Matt, Matt's body on the weekends. Wow. Now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. That's the, the type of thing that we're we're talking about. Then, of course, you've got William Tyrrell, which uh, I led for four years, and uh, the family still haven't got answers for that. And it just it, it breaks my heart. It really does. I wanted to, obviously, I wanted to talk about the William Tyrrell case. It's something that I really yeah. wanted to talk to you about in depth, in person, in the studio. I really wanted to have you up here to do that. But I mean, as we said with yeah. the Rhino, it, it, who knows when that'll be? It's one of the biggest cases, um, I'm sure, in your career. I think it was four yeah. years that you were involved. Obviously, that's not the the longest case that you're involved in. But yeah. as far as publicity is concerned, that's you know, Australia has been so interested yeah. in that case, and for good reason. Yeah. Can you can you take us through the first steps in that case? You were how you were contacted, how you became yeah. involved, and maybe tell people because I, I think you know because it has been some time now, people start to forget about it. Um, could you perhaps remind people of what happened in that case and how you became involved? Yeah, it, it, uh, William Tyrrell. It was uh, I think seven years ago now, September seven years ago. I became involved in the event. I was a detective chief inspector at uh, Homicide and I took over the investigation five months into the investigation. So William was three years old. He was up at um, uh, Kendall on the mid-north coast. At, uh, Port Macquarie is probably the uh, nearest town. And yep. uh, with his, and it's public record, he was um, with his foster uh, parents and uh He'd gone to uh, the grandmother's place and he was out playing. It was a Friday morning. He was out playing in the uh, front yard. It was a semi sort of rural area and he he disappeared. And so there was a massive uh, police search and invariably with matters like this, 99% of the time the child's found. Um, This is just these one, these rare situations where William uh, wasn't found. And if you go to Benaroon Drive, it's... It's obvious. It's a dead end. It's a dead end street on the end of a, um, yeah, town that's got uh, yeah. It, uh, the point I'm trying to make here: it's not Benaroon Drive where William disappeared from. It's not a drive-through area. So to go out there, you've got to be heading out there to that location for a specific reason. So if it's not if it's a person looking for a kid, they're not cruising around Benaroon Drive looking for a, looking for a child. So um, it was, I knew I was going to take over the investigation. A lot of things had happened prior to me um, heading up up the investigation. When I first uh, looked at all the information that came in, we were overwhelmed with information from the public, obviously, with a, a crime crime like that. I went up to uh, Benaroon Drive because I like to get a sense of the crime scene, so literally up there sitting there getting a feel of you know, what the offender might have been feeling what was around there, the noises, the sounds, and just get a real feel of it. And uh, I led the investigation for uh, for four years. A lot of it was played out in public. There was a couple of suspects that were played uh, played out in public. 
but there was you know ninety percent of the people that were targeting uh, the public was not uh, not aware of. The media were very uh, interested in it for obvi obvious reasons, and uh, so four years I led the investigation, and it led to my uh, my downfall in my my career that. Uh, I would recorded some conversations with a person I was speaking to about William's disappearance. Look, uh, I've talked about that before and I say, I make no apologies for, uh, for what I did. I have had a reason to record those conversations and I believe a lawful reason. I was protecting the reasonable cause to protect my lawful interest. I won't bore you with the, all, all the details of it, but from that I got taken off the investigation. So that's over two, two years ago. And the sad part about that is that uh, I wasn't allowed to do a handover with uh, anyone, the, the police taking taking it over. That's a continual source of frustration to me. I, I think it's I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's right. I think there's a lot of stuff that was missed because I wasn't allowed to do a handover. Having said that, the police are putting resources into it, and I hopefully they will um, uh, will resolve it. Questions, and I sort of anticipate. Do I know who's taken William? I led the investigation for four years. So I, I had ideas, call them case theories, um, some indicators, the, the people that I, I was looking at, and I was removed from the investigation, I think two or three weeks before it went to the uh, coroner's court. I had a specific strategy I wanted to employ in the coroner's court, and that was not uh, not done. But I, I'm very wary, it's, it's yeah, the William Tyrrell case is not about me. It's about a kid that's, that's disappeared. It's unfortunate that I was taken off the investigation, but what we've got here is a three-year-old child that disappeared. Now, the New South Wales Police should be judged by their response to an investigation like that. Um, we can't accept that a three-year-old kid can disappear in a, in a location like that, and hopefully they're putting the resources in. I fought, as I usually did, to keep resources when I'm... Um, you know, heading up an investigation like that. The foster family and the biological family are just traumatised by William's disappearance. And uh, the coroner, the matter's before the coroner, so I don't want to, um, yeah, anticipate what the coroner's findings may or may not, not be. Uh, she was due to come back with findings earlier this year. It's been put off for some reason. I, I'm not uh, privy to what's going on with the investigation at the moment, but uh, I certainly got uh, strong views on the direction it, it should go on. Um, you do question yourself when you're heading up an investigation like that for four years. Would have I done anything uh, different? I've been investigating homicides for over 20 years at that stage. If I didn't think I had the skill set to do the investigation, I would have happily handed it over to someone else but uh i had the uh i had the experience and i had the passion and uh it's one it's oh, it is the biggest disappointment of my career the way that i was uh, taken off it and uh i chose to leave the police i wasn't sacked from the police but uh when you've been uh working at the coalface like i had and then just been put in a room to uh yeah you yeah, can't take sit. a step back no way like you're doing that no, for so I, long I, yeah i and i don't think like, I think I, if I showed, like, I got caned at the court, I got convicted, I got convicted on appeal, I got fined $10,000. I think if I showed contrition, it would have been something different. But that's not who I am. And uh, I'm not going to apologise for things that uh, I don't think I did anything wrong. And uh, I, I stand by that. Now, some people might call me an arrogant prick for, the, for being that. That's who I am. I, I can justify everything that I did on that, uh, that case and I'm not going to make any apologies. Will I change anything? Yeah. If I knew I only had four years to solve it, I would have even gone harder. <laughs> now, people yeah. might be shocked by that. Look, he's learned nothing from his mistakes. But, yeah, I was well-placed to make the decisions I was making and the, the direction I had that investigation in. And I, I'm sorry if people want to hear me apologise. I'm not going to apologise. And, yeah, that'll, that'll have people come back at me. But so be it. Well, you, you, you say mistakes, but you were you were – convicted on an interpretation of the law and different people had different interpretations. It wasn't like a cut and dry, you know, you've done something very, very bad. This was all yeah. interpretations. Yeah, I, I know. And the, the sad part, I was played out like I was Roger Rogerson. 
Like, yeah, this exactly. Is, you, yeah. you got the, the you got the Channel Nines chasing you down the street, and set Channel Sevens behind them, and it's like, no, this guy's, it, you know, he's 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 done something that's been interpreted as the wrong thing. It's not like you know he he hasn't taken the kid. Like that's yeah. where the interest should be. I I know it, it was it, it was a bizarre experience, and uh, I don't know. It's uh, it was a strange one, like walking in the court. Um, your life's all about experiences and I'm all up for an experience. And so, yeah, well, I've got an experience walking in the court as the, uh, the defendant. And uh, what a strange experience walking in the court. As I'm walking up the steps of court, there's a large crowd cheering and chanting oh, my really? name. And wow. I didn't know what to do. So I waved to them. Like it was, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Who can like, prepare like Michael that? Jackson going into court. <laughs> hey. Yeah. What, yeah. What? <laughs> Fuck. What 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 do you do? It was bizarre what happened yeah. with that circumstance. Now I laugh about it, but it rocked me to the core. I had my dark right. dark moments, but I've got to laugh about it now. And uh, yeah, they're portraying me out to be uh, Roger Rogerson. I'm speaking to some hardcore crooks on uh, on my podcast, and I, I don't think I've got a lot of street credibility with my uh, charge sheets of uh, no, recording no. Uh, conversations on, on my phone. And the irony is. I go from that, and then I become a podcaster. So I have, I get paid professionals to help me record conversations. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> you do too. <laughs> You've moved on from the phone, but yeah, it's, I, I, um, I obviously didn't learn. <laughs> no, and and as you shouldn't. Like I mean, obviously you did nothing wrong. It was just you're trying to do the right thing by yourself in an investigation where it's taking so many twists and turns, and you don't know where it's going to go. Do you think yeah. they'll ever resolve it? I like to think that uh, I left it in a reasonable state that there was, you know, that it could still be um, resolved. Uh, I'd like to think so. And look, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not attacking the police working on it now. I'm sure everyone, there's no, no one in the police. I'd like to think there's no one in the police that doesn't want to see a matter like that solved. And uh, we really, we do need to solve it. We've got to give the community confidence that uh, a crime like that can't happen. And, we should be judged on our performance here. Like that's, you know, what are we there for if we can't uh, can't uh, bring justice on something like that? Three-year-old kid, and I think why it got so much attention was everyone could relate to William. That that photo of him in the Spider-Man suit just shortly before he disappears, that angelic smile, yeah. and the fact that a three-year-old kid playing at his grandparents' place, everyone could relate to that. And uh, yeah, so it, well, it's, it's a every sad moment. every parent's worst nightmare not being able to find their kid and to see him as as, yeah as you said in that spider-man outfit cute little kid he's out the front having the time of his life not a worry in the world and then somehow he just disappears and you know as you said you're sitting out there trying to get a feel for it i'm sure if it's like as you said like that that uh dead end road near the bush uh quiet all of a sudden you got a kid doing his thing, doing whatever he was doing, and then it's just, it's quiet. Like he never existed. Yeah. And then that's how oh. it's been for seven years. Yeah, I, I know. It, it needs needs to be mm. solved. And there, there's lines of inquiry that uh, should be explored and could, could be explored. And, and when I hate saying the word hopefully because you, you, you should be able to say it, we're going to solve it, like have that confidence. Because people would ask me, like four years, did that drag on? I felt the weight every day of... of that investigation that the the public wanted answers but more importantly the the families needed and deserved answers and uh, i felt the weight every day and that's why i i say and i i'm not sort of pissing in the wind here i'm I'm saying if i didn't think i had the skills to do it i would have handed it over because i wouldn't like that type of pressure if i was out of my depth investigating a matter matter like that but uh yeah it's one that's sort of um yeah, it's impacted on a, a lot of lives, and uh, I, I think it's a, a for the families. It's just devastating, and then to see the cops, this internal conflict with me and the cops, like how heartbreaking would that be for the families? What are you idiots doing? Why aren't you concentrating on finding William rather than fighting amongst yourselves? So, but yeah, it, yeah. it's it was an experience, but uh, smarter people than myself. Because I fight or flight, like I tend to uh, like to fight, and smarter people than myself sort of pulled me aside and said, "Yeah, they were worried I was just going to go on the offensive right, fr- right from the start." And 
I'm pretty proud of the way that uh, I conducted myself. I, I wasn't throwing spite everywhere or, or anger. And I'd like to say that was that was me, but that was people around me advising me that was the best way because my initial reaction was, fuck you. And yeah. uh, I, I, I go at them. But I think that would have done myself a disservice. So, yeah. But you can understand that response. It's a personal attack on you and everything you've put your, your heart and soul into for four years at that point and the, the career preceding it. Um, and to have it attacked everywhere and your name dragged. Well, I mean, when I say your name dragged through the mud, I mean, you were, you were, maybe you were dragged through the mud in the courts and, and in the police, yeah. but in the, the as you said, with the crowd out the front and in, the, um, in public opinion, everyone was like, yeah, we well, trying to catch the bad dude. Let him do whatever he's got to do. Yeah. I understand there has to be a process, but everyone's just like, yeah, cool. Get that fucking bad dude. They, they, uh, when the day I got, uh, the day I got uh, charged or the papers uh, served on me. Um, really? It was a, uh, I think it was a, a Friday. And yep. uh, I'd been told the day before by my barrister that, uh, that uh, I was circulated as wanted. So I should give myself up, which <laughs> Thought pretty wow. pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm on on the run. No, actually, you know where I live, and uh, so I went. I, I went what everyone does when you're on the run. I went to the pub. <laughs> oh, my last night of freedom. <laughs> um, the next uh, next day, I rang um, the people from professional standards and said, "Well, yeah, you know where I live. Come come to my place. Serve the papers on me there." And that was sort of uh, uh, might have been seven thirty. I phoned. Uh, to meet me at eight thirty, and uh, it was a lead story on on the news. Fifteen minutes later, so before even the papers, so someone within the police, because they, they're the only ones I was dealing with, felt the need to release it to the media, and uh, yeah, that that came up at my court matter, and there's been no investigation into how Why? that happened. And- Why would that be the the main thing they're trying to do on that day? I have no idea, but I I just it, it was. And not just release. And I was getting phone calls from a lot of journalists, and there was stuff that they were getting back briefed on, and yeah. stuff that was simply untrue. And I, I said to one of the people, like, I got thick skin. Um, I don't really do defamation, but uh, my barrister is very keen on defamation, and uh, so you better be careful with what's uh, what's being put out there. And that that hurt me, like. My organisation, like someone within the organisation do, doing that to really paint it and really cloud the issue, I just thought that's I, I, well, it was pathetic, really. It's, mm. uh, um, yeah, but taking all yeah. those resources away from where it should be focused, and I, and, and as 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 you said before, yeah. there has to be you know um, checks and balances with anyone, but you'd 100%. think you'd think yeah. that you know this all this time and and this the resources and. Um, even with the the journalists, like you'd think, come on, like let's talk about finding this kid, or you know, as the old the old, and I'm sure you heard this a lot of time as a cop. You know, why don't you yeah. go out there and catch the real bad guys? Well, why don't you go out there and catch the real bad guys in this situation? Yeah, well, I I just uh, the passion and the effort that went into going after me. I wish that they um, gave me those resources to use to uh, find out what happened to what happened to William. And, you know, I joke, as you can see, I've moved on from it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, or trying to. Um, no, but, but yeah, it, but, you know. As, it, it, does, as- it, it, it comes back it comes back to me and I think about it and, it, you know, I, I'm pissed off and, yeah, I know that uh, I could have, they wanted me to just bow down to them and say, oh, I'm wrong, I, I'm sorry. I didn't help myself when um, I think it was the district court uh, I'd just been the court that day and I, I got up and bought the paper in the morning and there's on the front page of the paper me, I think it was at uh, Coogee Beach, standing there going, I'd rather go to jail and pay a $10,000 fine on the front page. <laughs> I've looked at that and thought, probably not a good idea. But anyway, it's, uh, it, is who I, it is who I am and it's, yeah, I, I was authentic in that. And people ask me about that. Yeah, you know, are you serious? You're a copper, you want to go to jail? You're, you're not going to be too popular in there. And I know the consequences of me going to jail, but I am stubborn and it just pissed me off for paying a fine uh, for doing police work. And if I'm that bad, send me to jail. But that, that, was, that was the attitude I had. I think you've got to have a hill to die on, though. You can't just cop everything. 
Like it's it's yeah. even the same with this with the Rona stuff. At some point, there's got to be a hill that you die on. You say no, no, you can't. You can't just keep copying this shit. You have to yeah. have some sort of reserve where it's like no, no, this is this is the point where I say enough. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I that, think- that's that's what I think. That was me drawing the line in the sand and going, "Look, I know what you want me to do, but you're not you're not controlling me." Yeah, I'll lose my job. I'll lose the job that I loved. I was in the cops for 35 years. I'll lose that. I'll walk away from it. But you're not going to. I'm not going to pretend to be something something I'm not. So, and since I've come out of it, like, yeah, I'm, I'm angry angry about it but it, it, it fades as the time goes on and I, I was fortunate that I've had options outside the cops and you know doing stuff in the media and writing a book and all that so it sort of opened my eyes up to other things and what I've realized too is and you talked we or we talked earlier on with cops change you know being in the cops it's a very insular world you think and you breathe and you everything is about about police work and uh it's quite refreshing um stepping away from uh away from that environment seeing that there is an actual world world outside uh nick Caldos, um ex deputy commissioner he pulled me aside um very early and i've utmost respect for for nick he's a, a great uh great person he said to me jubes yeah when you do walk away from the police you realize how small that that world is you think everything hangs on what goes on in the cops but when you step away you realize there is a, a world outside the cops and doing stuff with um like the journalism it was uh, i was so nervous the first article i wrote and uh i, I was working or I am working with the sunday telegraph and claire harvey the deputy editor at the time she asked me to write an article on something and it was like uh, I'm doing a uni assignment. The whole state is going to read. I was, I was yeah. so nervous. And I sent uh, I sent the article. So I'm, I'm sitting at home and, you know, an experienced journalist could probably knock it out in half an hour. It took me a, a day of uh, trying to get it right and wishing I paid more attention at English at uh, school. And I sent it off to Claire. And she uh, texted or emailed me back and said, yeah, got it. And I'm thinking, oh, that sounds really positive, doesn't it? And then I, I've gone into work and I'm thinking I'm stuffed. I can't write. They've employed me as a journalist. I can't even do an article. And when I've come in, uh, she was wiping up coffee on her uh, her desk. And she actually uh, said to me, and I hadn't realised she'd text me saying, that's great, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she said, I was reading your article and I spilt my coffee. I didn't, we didn't think you could actually, you could write. So she gave me that and that gave me the confidence. But I've had to learn a lot of things uh, about writing because in policing, it's a fact sheet. So at such and such, we commence this podcast at uh, 2, 2 p.m., blah, blah, blah. It's it's factual. And I had to become more descriptive. But uh, it's amazing and I'm a big believer in uh, paying your dues in any industry and I, I know I've sort of been parachuted into the level that I, I didn't really deserve just because of uh, circumstances. But a couple of things that were pointed out to me, I'd, I'd do an article and I'd, I'd hand it to um, someone like Claire and she'd just cha- not change the content of it but move the first paragraph to the third paragraph. And she made the point that uh, your third paragraph is always more powerful than your first paragraph, so swap it round. And, and little tricks like that that I, I'm trying to uh, pick up. So I'm, I'm enjoying it. And yeah, so, I mean, if, you, if you're thrown yeah. and you're thrust into it, you just have to be prepared. And it sounds yeah. like you have your head screwed on in a way where you're just like, yep, all right, I'll be the hardest worker or, or, or I'll be the most prepared or I will be the one that puts in the extra hour of work to get the project done and then I yeah. will be at the level of the people who have been in the game for 20 years. Yeah, uh, and I, I like that and that's the way I, I did policing. I never took it for granted. I didn't get to a point in homicide that, ah, oh, I've done this, this is easy. So e- each job... You're only as good as your last job. And even with, yeah. with the podcast too, like I try to, with the podcast, I, I'm always, okay, I want to try and smash this one. You, you do some good ones. You do some ones where you think, oh, I missed it a little bit there. So different things, but I'm enjoying it. And what I'm enjoying outside the cops is working with creative people. That is, it's not so, well, saying journalism's not competitive, it, it very much is. But if you do something good, you get some compliments. 
I can't remember the last time I was complimented for anything I did in the police. And yeah, I'm talking the last 10 years of my career. I can't mm. remember one person saying, oh, well done. And uh, maybe I didn't do anything good. I don't know, but I can't remember one compliment. But out in the media, if, if I've, I've done something good, people are, are not afraid to come up and say, oh, well done. And that little bit of encouragement goes a long way, doesn't it? It's, uh, if you oh, get someone. Hey, you know, absolutely it does. And, and I think you can uh, sort of fall into this false sense, like doing what I do, people, you know, they'll compliment you and you sort of get into this sense of like, I'm doing everything great, but it's great to have, that's why I love doing stand up is if you bomb, if you do something terrible on stage, you know about yeah. it, people don't yeah. laugh. And I think a lot of people in the creative field, whether it's podcasts or journalism, they don't have that immediate feedback from the people out yeah. in the world. That's what I love about doing things live. I don't know if you've ever done anything live, but you find things out straight away. You, you find it out well, if you've I, had this... Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting you say that. And it, it's I know how confronting it is. Like I, I do a lot of public speaking and that. And yeah, you either got the group or you haven't got the group. And if you haven't mm. got the group, it's a, you, it's a death by a thousand cuts. Yes. Um, COVID's put a stop to it, but we had um, a uh, show coming up, I Catch Killers live show at Edmore Theatre and uh, around the around the country. I was doing it with Rob Carlton. I don't know if you know Rob Carlton. Um, he's a, a actor. Okay. And uh, he's a good uh, good mate of mine. And uh, so we were doing a, a, a I Catch Killers live stage show, and uh, we had uh, you know shows lined up. They've all been postponed now. Um, but we're doing the Enmore Theatre and one in Brisbane and uh, Melbourne and Adelaide and all that. I was really looking forward to it, but between you and me, and let's not tell anyone, I was very nervous about it too. I bet you were, yeah. I, uh, because it's really putting yourself out there and, uh, you know, if, if it went flat, it'd be, oh, Jesus, where do we go from there? But I, Rob Carlton was my safety net because he's a bit of a, a wild, um, loose unit and uh, he knows how to, uh, you know, keep things on track but I was looking forward to that but it, these are the challenges that I like but you know you're doing stand up stand up work I uh, my kids say to me um, yeah don't you go there I'm the person in the audience that gets picked on because I'm always a serious looking dude and you'll look down yeah. at me and go hey what, what are you doing here and then I'll <laughs> yeah so uh, even yeah street uh, uh, street performers I'd be walking with my kids and they go dad don't go past there and sure enough someone would point me out and uh, yeah I, I'd be the one that was the butt of the jokes but uh, yeah uh, I do you get nervous before you do yeah terrified um, yeah I uh, <laughs> I basically my fear stems from a lot of different places. It's I've, I've got a weird form of epilepsy that I, I fear that it'll happen on stage. Not that it ever oh, has, right. and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. medicated for it. It hasn't happened in years, but the fear is real yeah. and is there. Um, the other fear is that, and this is my biggest fear, is that people won't – they've paid good money to come and see me live and they won't get their money's worth. So I, I fight tooth and nail every single time yeah. I get on stage to make sure that they get their money's worth. And if they don't, I'm pissed off at myself. And I, yeah. I like to think of myself as enough of a professional that it very rarely happens. But if I have a bad set, I've, I've got the shits and I'll stay up all that night, listen back to it and make sure I fix it for the next night. But I find that I do enjoy my time on stage, but I enjoy it afterwards. There's a big battle that happens in my head before I go on stage to make sure it's perfect. Yeah. And then once it's perfect and I know I've nailed it, then I'm happy. Um, but yeah. I think if you, it's like anything. If you don't go in and you're not, if you're not nervous, then you know you don't give a shit, and then you're not going to have a good product, and you won't be back the next year. I think I think that's yeah. really where it stems from. Yeah, and it, it tells me a lot about yourself too that with people are paying money because I know I, I do uh, uh, speaking gigs, and uh, when I was in the cops, obviously I wasn't getting paid for it, but I, I do a lot of some pretty big uh, gigs speaking. I wasn't nervous because the people have asked me to come along. I'm not getting paid for it, so I'll, I'll do my best. When I say I wasn't nervous, I, I was nervous, but I didn't feel like, yeah, they've paid money to to see me. I've been invited along. Yes. When I'm doing the paid gigs or whatever, I feel more pressure and thinking, oh, these poor people have dipped into their pocket. Well, I better better perform. But I reckon anything in life, and this is how I, I approach policing, I was always trying to improve. Like I never got to the point where I thought I've nailed it, even – successful cases i'd look back and go how could i have done that better um where i got most nervous um was before um giving evidence at court like 
I'm making decisions in a, 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 yeah, three or four years before where we've locked someone up or we're doing this or doing that and I'm going to be in the witness box and I've got people being paid, you know, five, ten thousand dollars a day to make me look stupid and I'm not the smartest person to start with as is. So you'd go into court and I, I would be lecturing to young detectives and uh, I'd ask who, uh, who gets nervous before court and some of the cool tough Dudes would be, nah, I don't get nervous before court. Nah, it's good. I know they're the ones that would stuff up in court. The ones that get nervous are the ones that I, I like, that they prepare, they understand that they need to prepare. If they don't prepare, they're going to uh, fall short. So it, It's a battle. You know, you got to go into it like a battle. It's like when, when I used to play footy and that, it was always a battle and, you know, you have to have fear, yeah. otherwise you don't care. Um, and it's, it, it's often I find the stupid people that aren't scared. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's I the do, people that I haven't they haven't played they it over come, in their head a thousand times. And they come out and they have stuffed up and they still don't care. Mm. I found it very difficult in management where I was managing people that uh, would make a mistake. And we all make a mistake. I've made mistakes today. At least it only impacts on me in lockdown. But, yeah, we all make, make mistakes. It's how you react to those mistakes. And I'd have people at work that would make mistakes. And, you know, that's part and parcel of uh, being, being a detective, police officer or, or anything. Some people have made horrendous mistakes and I'd get them into my office and uh, I would say, yeah, Isaac, yeah, you forgot to do this and because you forgot to do this, this has happened, blah, blah, blah. Like there's ramifications. And I can see them and they're sitting there. I'm thinking, shit, if that was me, I would not sleep that night. I would go home feeling sick that night. And I'd, I'd speak to Isaac, who's stuffed up on the investigation. And then five minutes later, I'd see you over with your mates just laughing as if nothing's happened. Like, how do you correct behaviour that way where people don't care or don't take pride? You can't. I couldn't manage people that didn't take pride in their own performance. I, I, I struggled with it because they just didn't care. I think it's so. just the, the the cut of the person, and as we spoke about earlier, like how they've been brought up or the environment they've been brought up, and there is a way to sort of rectify it. You can make those decisions, but you know, you look at yourself. You've spent all these years in the police. You know, a, a majority of your working life has been in the police, yeah. and then there's this massive downfall, and you're like, oh my god, what's going to happen now? Either you yeah. take that and you go and you get on the piss and you start gambling and you ruin your entire life, yeah. or you channel that. Uh, that drive, that that almost anger, and you yeah. you create something positive from it, and that's the that's yeah. you, you see people, um, you know, they live or they die by that. I I didn't want to I didn't want to go through life being bitter, and yeah. uh, I what happened to me could have left me that way, and I could I, I could find a, a thousand cops, ex cops that I could sit down and we could whinge about uh, this that bloody cops that type, type of thing, but I didn't want to be that person. And it's, yeah, even, and again, smarter people than myself have said, well, you know, if you're going to try and work in the media or, or do stuff, no one wants this story of, oh, me, oh, my. They want a story of, oh, you're kicked in the guts and, look, you've just bounced back up and, and got on get, got on with things. So it's it has changed me as a person. I think it's made me a better person. Um, I'd like to think I'd, I'd try to improve yeah, you know, all, all the time be a better person than I was last year or yeah, you know, next year hopefully be a better person. But it's made me reflect on things. Um, I have been going round. I, I know a lot of my success with my career is because of sacrifices people close to me have made. So I've spent a lot of my time since I've left the cops going around apologising to friends and family because, sure, yeah, yeah I, I was absent because I, I was carving out a career and that was, you know, a, a, in the foremost of uh, what I was uh, focused on. So that's sort of given me some perspective. So I, I look at that as well. But I, when the um, uh, cops were taken away from me, there was some low points. Like I, I, I think the worst I got was about 11 a.m. one morning, I'm sitting on the lounge in my underwear and I'm thinking, you gotta, you got to get your shit here together. Like yeah. I, I, was, I, I could have just wallowed in self-pity. And so I, I try to put some structure in life. I've always trained. I, I love training. So I make sure I train each day. I feel feel good. You're, you're feeling healthy. And then, yeah, each day try and have a purpose. And not dissimilar to how I'm trying to survive, uh, you know, lockdown. Each, each day trying to achieve, you know, one, one or two things. So 
I think I think it comes down to small wins. Like if you can train, like uh, as I was saying before, I'm running a bit now, and I've always been terrible yep. at running. When I was playing footy, I was a front rower, so I was on for you know ten fifteen minutes, and then I was having a sleep yep. on the bench. I've always been terrible at running. And I spoke to one of my mates who's uh, also my tour manager, Kai, and his mum's a triathlete. And she was yeah. saying, you know, just extra two minutes. If you try, if you run on every second day or every day, extra two minutes. Yeah. So I started at 15 minutes. Uh, okay. Then I go to 17 minutes. I'm now coming up to 30 minutes. You know, the next run I do is now yeah. 30 minutes. And, and so it's all these small wins. And it's the same with anything, whether you're writing something, if you've got a, uh, you know, you've, you've got an article you've got to get out uh, for this Sunday's paper, you know. Small wins, just get a paragraph done, get a second paragraph done. For me yeah. with my videos, you know, I, I need to make sure that, okay, I have them all written by Tuesday, I film on the Tuesday, and I need to make sure they're all sent off to the editor before Wednesday morning. Even though he won't edit them until Friday, I need to have them yeah. there. And it's that structure that's in place that gets me, um, gets everything done by a deadline. Having those personal deadlines and those deadlines that if you don't get them done, you know within yourself that you're not doing the best things that are going to make you the best person. And I, I feel that there's a lot of people that don't have that. Right now during lockdown, there's people that may have had that two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and now they've just yeah. gone, no, it doesn't matter. And I feel that that's, a, that's the worst thing you can possibly do as a human being if you want to be successful at whatever you're doing is not make yourself accountable. I, yeah, I agree with what you're saying there 100%. And, and lockdown is a test. It's a, it's a test of each day thinking, okay, I've got to do something. And it doesn't, like when in Sydney, when we're first, the first two weeks, the lockdown just for two weeks, I got a fair bit done because I thought, well, why I can't be out and about doing other stuff? I'll get this work done. So I had a clear picture. Then when they've extended it, I'm thinking, well, if I don't prepare for this podcast to write that chapter today, there's no big drama because I can do it tomorrow. Like every day is like a Sunday. <laughs> like I just yes. keep putting, yeah. putting it off. And I, you you can lose a week. You can lose a week if you, you fall into that trap. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm very conscious of uh, conscious of that. And uh, I, I get up and uh, I'll, I'll have a training session, whether I, I whatever I do, you the gyms are shut. I've got a punching bag at home, which is good. That that helps me and uh, do what I can do. Feel uh, feel good about that, and then uh, sit down and do do some uh, work or try to do some work. So, and in in the creative field too, and and I guess for people working at home, um, if you don't have a structure in place, then as you said, you treat every day like a day off, and then it comes to the end of the week and you haven't done anything. Um, you know, I treat my job as a as a nine to five job. Monday morning, yeah. I'm, you know, ripping in from eight o'clock, you know, I smash yeah. it out. And then if I'm, you know, if I've got everything done by Thursday, wonderful. I find myself yeah. productive for four hours and that's about it. So I just get, just rip in, get it done and then I'm done, you know, that type of thing. And I did that from early on with YouTube because I, I, yeah. I saw so many people rise and then a year later they've disappeared. You know, yeah. if, it did, if you don't put it in and treat it like a job, like a business, um, it just disappears. It, it, it no, you no longer remain at the level you're at, and I think that's why you see so many people go by the wayside because they just don't treat it like that. They treat it like this this strange thing that just appears and then it disappears. Um, um, without that ability to treat it like they treat it like a hobby, and you can't treat yeah. it like a hobby. You need to go no. balls deep, otherwise it just disappears. I, I've always been been a big one to give it a hundred percent, and I, I fail at a lot of stuff. But I don't fail through lack of trying. I, I fail because I'm not not good at whatever I'm, I'm trying trying to achieve. Mm. But uh, I, yeah, you you mentioned football. It's like training, preparing. If you're uh, you've got uh, um, whatever. I, I played soccer, not uh, not league when I was growing up, and then I got into martial arts and boxing and all that, and. I know if I was going, if I if I had something coming up, I would train because if I didn't train, I'd get besides getting your head smacked in, if, if step into a boxing ring, um, you weren't there, weren't able to give everything that you wanted to give, and that's part of the fun. I like the preparation. I like the preparation of, of building yourself up or uh, yeah, getting ready for something. That's that's part of the fun. And I think you know you you obviously you've encountered a lot of these people more than I, but people who aren't. Uh, mentally tough, you know, the, the weaker people in society. They don't seem to have that background of playing a sport or a martial art. I know with uh, my, you know, I'm a 
not to talk myself up, but uh, in jiu-jitsu, I'm a white belt with two stripes. So, you know, watch out. Uh, yeah. But being in the um, – if, if you've got some – big dude on top of you and he's trying yeah. to strangle you if you can remain calm in that situation yeah. and think clearly you can do that anywhere in life whether it's business yeah. or writing or whatever you know and i think that yeah. really it's something i really want to get my kids into at a young age is some form of martial arts just to sort of train them and prepare them for the rest of their lives yeah i look i see the benefit of it I, i've been doing martial arts for yeah you know, oh most of my adult life and uh, I, I drift into it, drift out of it, but really enjoy it. And it gives you, it gives you a confidence. It certainly gave me a confidence in, um, in policing. If you're coming up against a, a bad guy that uh, I kickboxing and boxing were, were my, my things. That's what I do. And some uh, Kung Fu. I like the traditional side of Kung Fu and that got me into uh, Qigong, which is like a Tai Chi meditation thing. All of which were uh, were great. That coupled with playing team sport, I think team sport's in, important too because it gives you that social skill. To yeah, you can be the butt of the joke, or you know, you, you're hunting a pack. It, it, it makes you work out how to uh, you know just day to day things with life. But the martial arts has helped helped me. And uh, when with the stresses that come with homicide homicide work. The best thing that I could do is uh, go to go to a gym and jump into a ring with someone that's better than me because I can assure you I'm not worried about what's happening at work at the time. I'm worried about how I stop getting mm. kicked in the head or or, or belted. So I, I've enjoyed that, and that gives that's given me a good uh, good balance. And uh, I promote it, but I'm not um, I'm not one of these um, fitness freaks that oh, you can't do this or you know if you're going to train you got to train every day. I do train every day. But I also have a drink when I feel like having a drink and, and that. So it's not this pure. I see a lot of people come into a healthy lifestyle and they burn themselves out because they're um, too addicted to the healthy lifestyle and they can't sustain it. Yin and yang, and I've, I've mentioned it once before, but that's very much how I try to uh, live my life. You know, I'll do the hard stuff. I'll do the soft stuff and balance, balance it all out. But it's, it's helped me. And uh, when I got into um, uh, Qigong, um, well, probably 25 years ago or, or more. Like not many people did meditation back then and it was looked at, you know, when I turned up as a cop, people would be going, what's this weird dude doing? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. 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 what are you doing here, man? You're, You're wrecking it. the bike. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it's helped me so much. It, it's helped me so much when I went through the trauma at, um, or oh, <clears> I went trauma that's too strong a word there's real trauma it was just the setback when uh, the things uh, hit the fan in the cops that was something it was a tool I had that I, I could use and uh, I went uh, when it first broke about the uh, about the police I, I took uh, two weeks off went over to uh, Bali and went to a yoga retreat for a couple of couple of weeks and I'd done one over in Nepal and really enjoyed it and went went here and it, it was good it was it was good I, I probably stole the Zen vibe in the place because I was so pissed off and cranky, but it was good for me in being stuck. And it was way up in the hills in, uh, in Bali and it was just set up and it was literally nothing to do except uh, meditate and uh, put yourself in painful yoga positions and, and that yeah. and did that for uh, 10 days. I, I think I did that. And then uh, when I finally escaped from the place and it felt like an escape, um, it, it was good for me, but and I didn't realise at the time how good it was for me until I got away from it. But uh, yeah, I think so. a lot of people in those situations, and you were basically you were cancelled by the police. That was sort of what you know I sort of relate yeah. to. You were cancelled. Uh, it was cancel yeah. culture coming for you. Um, yeah. People don't get that you know it does blow over. Things do return yeah. to normal. It doesn't matter how much speculation or media eyes or whatever is on you. Yeah. Um, you know, it will stop. Like I know my my situation with, uh, you know, the media watching me was nowhere near yours. But, you know, it was a particular joke that yeah. I told and everyone was sort of cranky at me and all that type of stuff. Man, yeah. you know, it blew over. It was a week of people yeah. having the shit on Twitter. And then after that, it was like, yeah, you know, back to normal. Life doesn't change. You know, it's it's all yeah. over. It doesn't matter. And yeah, that's um, something uh, that that's something that you mentioned too. That um, if putting yourself out in the media, that uh, you are vulnerable if people criticise you, and uh, mm. it, it, it can attack your self confidence. And uh, 
I didn't worry so much. And I had a high profile when I was in the cops, but if people didn't like me, I don't care. I'm a cop. I'm trying to catch a killer. It's yeah. But then when I work in the media, then I became a little bit more sensitive to, oh, is what I'm doing good or you know, criticism. And I can see how that eats people up, that social media. And I don't fully understand it. I don't fully in, embrace the, the social media. It's not something that I'm on all the time. But uh, uh, my uh, my children said to me, you know, with the podcast, you know, you could you get criticised on the podcast. Some people get savage on social media and all that. I didn't realise the extent of it um, or the potential extent of it until I was involved in it. And I think if I if I knew, I'd even consider yeah. maybe I wouldn't go in the media and. Uh, yeah, people, hey, pe- got people really will hammer you. Profile. People yeah. will hammer you. People will hate you regardless of what you do. You could do the best podcast ever and there'll be some dickhead going, you suck, Garrick. Like, yeah. It's just the way it works. Like, you, you, Because the ability with social media is everyone can put their beautiful opinion out into the world. And unfortunately, yeah. there are a lot of people whose opinion you wouldn't listen to in a million years, but because it's written there on the page, you're just like, oh, well, I can't believe Susan from you know, bloody Docklands in Melbourne thinks I'm a piece of shit. Oh, my God. You know, this is breaking my heart. But you just, you just, my, my way is you post it and you never look at the comments. Just never, never, never listen and, to them. And anyone that's been, you know, in the media or had a profile, that's advice everyone gives. And I, I think you're right. Uh, you can't, you can't look at it because you can have a hundred good comments and then one, one personal bad comment. One. Here we go. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Uh, I, one of the best comments I got was uh, for my book, um, I Catch Killers, which was a memoir, and someone was critical of that uh, the book was about me. It was all about me. I thought, well, that's what a memoir, <laughs> that's what a memoir is meant to be. I should have written it about Isaac. <laughs> you know, this is my memoir about Isaac. But, but there are yeah. there are some dead shits in the world, and I'm sure you yeah. you encounter them in policing, and I bet you you're going to encounter a lot more being involved in the in the media and in social media. It's uh, yeah. it's 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 a given in life, you know, taxes, death, and dickheads. I think that's yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what's going to happen to you. And to be able to have because policing made me serious. Like people would say. Um, yeah, we never see you smile. And I say, well, you can't really smile when you're standing in a murder scene or you're talking about a, a murder. But um, it was making me more serious. I'm looking at everything, this sort of tunnel vision. And to be able to laugh at yourself or just laugh about situations is good. And that's I've got some friends, you know, that way back from school days. And the beauty of, beauty of that is that they put shit on you. They know who you are from, yeah, you, you can't put on a persona. You can't pretend to be anything. And they're the ones that I, I like hanging out with that uh, just put it all in perspective. Like yeah. if you're down about something, they'll, they'll just take the piss out of you and, uh, yeah, make you laugh at yourself. And I think that's good uh, good as well. well. Definitely good. you got to remain grounded. That's where I love where I live. It's like if I go into a big show, like I played the Endmore a few years ago and yeah. uh, it was amazing, 2,000 people, my biggest show I've ever yeah. done. And then the next morning I was at home in Newcastle just at the shops and yeah. no one cares. It's great. It's yeah. a great way to just bring you back down. They're just like, I'm just some dickhead with a beard. It doesn't matter anymore, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but as you said, with the, with the police, everything becomes serious and you become a serious person. The opposite yeah. happens with comedians. It's like as soon as something bad happens on the TV or anything happens in the news, yeah. anything, you, you, you need to be the first one to make a joke about it. And sometimes that's yeah. bad because something horrible happens, like what's happening in Afghanistan, and you start thinking... Why don't I make a joke about this? It's so you have to be, yeah. you know, you need to be careful not to be too serious. I need to be careful about what I say because I might come off as an absolute piece of shit, which has happened before. But uh, what I like about uh, about comedians or, or people, uh, actors, actors as well, that the the good actors really observe life in a different way. Like you understand yeah. it. Like I, I get it when if I'm speaking to a comedian or speaking to an actor or that. You've got a sense of social justice. You do understand it. And uh, I, I, I really don't like the way, you know, comedians get criticised for making making an inappropriate joke because half the time that's what we're coming there to hear. And we know that as a comedian, it's not your your thoughts, but you just want to get a, a, get a reaction. And it's a tough gig if you've got to be politically correct and uh, all the time and you want to make people laugh. How do you make people laugh if we're all saying the same thing? So, but some people go to these shows because they want to be, they want to be outraged and they want to find something to be angry at. 
Like that's what I never get is when someone walks out of a show of mine. It's like, well, what do you think was going to fucking happen? This is the whole point. Well, I'm I'm yeah. trying to be outrageous. <laughs> and Dickhead. I I don't understand the mindset if I listened to a podcast or read a book or whatever and uh, I could imagine I, I, I could be if I listen to a podcast I like it I could put in a couple of comments that it's good I don't understand the person that is so angry that they've got to go yeah type this horrible thing about a podcast or a book or an article or whatever why read it why listen to it yeah yeah. Well, that, you think a- think about it like this. Have you ever left like an angry Facebook comment? No. No, no exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like who would you who yeah. do you know anyone that would leave that? I, and would you ever hang no. out with that person? No way. No. I, like, I, they're the I, worst I, people. I, yeah. It's it's strange, isn't it? But that's that's people are growing growing up on that type of thing and there's some interesting observations like with the social media that before, if you wanted to complain about me, you could complain to your mates down the pub or wherever, your football team, oh, that jubilant's a dickhead. But now you have got the power to really put it out there and, uh, and yeah, public will read it. And it, it's giving, validating people's opinions when sometimes they shouldn't be validated. I don't think. No. Oh, no. mate. And, and it feeds into the culture war and the left and the right and the, the, the women versus the men and the black versus the white. Yeah. And it's just this whole... It, I, I think it's just an escape for people. It's the new religion. Yeah. People aren't religious anymore, so they have to have something to involve themselves in. And I, I get <laughs> right. that from a hum, human standpoint, but sometimes it's yeah. just poor. It's just a piss poor effort and people can't, for some reason, people can't understand nuance. And when you come to a comedy yeah. show and you get offended by things, it's like reading your book, I Catch Killers, yeah. and go, geez, he talked about too much murder. It's like, what the yeah, fuck yeah, did you yeah, think was going to happen? Don't think you should, yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you can't win. But uh, if you can have a laugh, at, uh, one thing, a, a, a skill that I'm probably not the best at it, but it, it's something that I tried to give to my, my kids, be able to laugh at yourself because, geez, that, that mm. makes life easier. If you can, yeah, I'm an idiot. I've stuffed up and, and laugh at yourself. If you don't take yourself too serious. I, I think that you're uh, you're on the path to a, a happier, more peaceful, peaceful life. It's but, just giving uh, other people ammunition if you're too scared of the things that people might find out. You know, like yeah. if if say for example, me, if if someone says that oh, you know, Butterfield, you got a receding hairline. It's like yeah, I know, yeah. fucking shit ass. <laughs> like can you can yeah. I paint it in? Like if you if yeah. you run around trying to hide it, like it's. Yeah. And that's what the ammunition and people will use against you. But oh, mate, well, um, let, let me let me tell you when I I did the first, the shave, like it it was liberating. I was away on holidays. I was up the coast with a group of friends, and uh, someone's uh, partner she had a clips, and she said, "Why don't you shave your head?" And I go, "Oh, I don't know. You don't know what shape your head's going to look like. You have no idea." Yeah. And you're worried about losing your hair. All of a sudden, there's no worry. Oh, what are you going to call me bald? Oh, really? Okay. Well, I know I'm bald. Yeah, that that type of thing. So yeah, I, I do hey, do understand. Mine's. I just want to. I got. I'm getting married next year. I'll get married, get the photos, and then it's gone. I'm I'm ready. I'm ready well, to go. That, see, I reckon that's a, that's a noble uh, goal to have. Just aim Thank for you. that. Get there. Just, yep. Hope it's not a windy day. Like, yep. Exactly. Sure exactly. It's but, uh, um. Oh mate, it's uh, people hammer me about it too, and they're like, "Oh, this, you're just this fucking bearded receipt." And I'm like, "I know, I know, mate. I, I agree. I'm an asshole. I get it." Uh, I, I can, I can assure you, life does carry on after after the hair goes. There, there is life to be had. It's not there's not light the at the end, end of the, of the tunnel. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Well, but, Gary, yeah. thank you very much for joining us, mate. My camera just died to the right of me, so we better wrap it up. Okay. Um, but mate. I Catch Killers is the podcast. I'm not just saying this because you're on the show. It is a good yeah. podcast. It's a good chat. Um, the people that you bring on are thoroughly interesting, as are you, and I'd like to thank you very much for your time, mate. Is there anything else you'd like to um, spruik? Do you, do you have Instagram? Are you involved in social media that far? No, not. If you follow, like, I, I Catch Killers, that, that does the uh, the podcasts and, uh, and what we're, tr- we're trying to achieve there. So uh, anything there. Um one shout out to uh, make sure people watch that Bowerville documentary when it comes out. It'll, what's it was, what's that coming out on? Do you know? I, it was going to come out with the Sydney Film Festival, but because of all the all the delays, I think the first screening 
at this stage was going to be up at uh, Barrable at the cinema up at Barrable. But uh, that's a really, uh, really powerful uh, the story. And uh, if we could encourage people to watch that. But uh, no, I've enjoyed coming on, Isaac. And uh, since I, I've started to listen to a few of your podcasts and I, I enjoy it, it's uh, very interesting. And uh, yeah, so... Good on I you, think mate. there's plenty of room in the world for a lot of podcasters. And I just, I don't know how you find it. I've really enjoyed podcasting. Um, out of all the things I'm doing, podcasting is something that I really enjoy because you can sit down and actually have a chat with people. And, it's great. Uh, and it, it's, it's, you just, ha- it's basically just having a beer at the pub. And that's what I love yeah. about it. I, I, and this is why I was hesitant in having you on over Zoom. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful it worked out the way yeah. it did. I just, I, lo- I, I much prefer to do it in person. But, at this point, yeah. it is what it is. But I'd like to have you on the show when the when the studio is built and uh, everyone's not crook and dying everywhere. So, um, but yeah, mate, uh, check out check out Eye Catch Killers on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you can get it. Um, thank you, mate. I appreciate your time. Cheers, Isaac. Thanks, mate. Good on your legend. Thank you very much. <laughs>